Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Dominic Rangillo, co-founder and executive director of Elected Officials to Protect America, and really appreciate you coming to our press conference on offshore wind. Elected Officials to Protect America's purpose is to protect our planet and our people. And we believe that our elected officials are public stewards of our democracy and our future and our communities, and that we must courageously lead in the face of uh, crises like the climate emergency, and that by working together across jurisdictions, levels of office, and states, that we have the power collectively to turn the tide on the issue. Uh, the purpose of our press conference for today is to discuss the responsible uh, build out of offshore wind and increased federal permitting. So, even with the Inflation Reduction Act, IRA's unprecedented $370 billion investments for clean energy which will support our security, health, and prosperity, we still have a way to go to meet our 50% emissions reduction goal. And offshore wind has the potential to be the biggest lever that we can pull to reduce our emissions, address the climate crisis, and meet those energy needs and grow our economy. And offshore, as an example, offshore wind is poised to become a $1 trillion industry by 2040 creating thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of good paying jobs, creating renewable energy and spring our economic growth. So the purpose for the press conference today is because more than 340 elected officials from across the country are asking the federal government to increase offshore wind goals and accelerate permitting. And today we'll hear from elected officials in New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, who are urging responsible offshore wind development to fight the climate emergency and stabilize energy prices and energy security. So first, we would are blessed to introduce Karen Fitzpatrick, who's an Atlantic County Commissioner in New Jersey and a member of uh, New York, uh, sorry, New Jersey, EOPA New Jersey's Leadership Council. Karen, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dominic. It's, it's my pleasure to be here and, and a very apropos time to be here. We just experienced a really severe, uh, one of the most severe hurricanes that the Eastern Seaboard has seen in a long time. It decimated Florida and uh, slowly made its way up here to New Jersey. And we also have been experiencing very severe weather, flooding, high winds um, due to this storm. Um, we actually at my office had the very first that I can remember flood day like a snow day where we couldn't get to our work because of back bay flooding, closing um, entryways into Atlantic City. Atlantic City is on an island, a barrier island. And so uh, we weren't able to do that. And, and I've often spoken about having to time our regular life lifestyles and lives according to the moon and the tides. And in 2022, uh, that, that doesn't seem reasonable. And one of the reasons that we have to do that is because of the damage of climate change. And so um, wind energy, uh, the offshore wind farms that are proposed up and down the East Coast primarily, you know, is, is of importance to me, um, will help uh, prolong or, or start to uh, alleviate the, those problems that we have. I, I don't know that we can uh, reverse what we have, but we can stop uh, making it worse for sure. Um, I believe that all lever levels of government owe it to their communities to acknowledge there is a problem, believe it or not, that, that there are some government officials who do not acknowledge that climate change is a problem and that wind energy is one of the best answers for that problem. Um, uh, like I said, back day flooding here um, on Absecan Island where Atlantic City is, is a uh, uh, used to be a once in a while, maybe once a quarter issue. Now, children can't get to school on full moon and high tide days because they're flooded into their homes. Um, I myself on a re normal regular day without a hurricane have had to turn around on my normal commute to work. Um, another problem that we have is, is that people don't want to accept the fact that this is a new world. We have uh, new challenges and as uh, pretty and precious as their memories may be, things have to change. We, ha we have a movement, a not so silent movement in our area to oppose the wind farms because of, you'll be able to see them from the beach. You'll be able to see the windmills from the beach. And what you'll be able to see from one town in, in particular, I, I, I looked at an interactive map 
and you really can't see them from everywhere, but one town, you can see what looks like boats on the, on the horizon, which we've been living with forever. I mean, we live on the seashore and boats come and go. And, uh, and that's what it's gonna look like. It's not going to be detrimental to property values as, as these people are, are uh, stating it will be. Um, governments have to start purchasing alternative fuel vehicles. They can't continue with uh, fossil fuel gas powered vehicles. It, uh, it, maybe it's gonna cost a little more, but if it's gonna, if what's, what's, the, what's the choice if, if we're not going to have the uh, use of, of our beaches and our, and our, uh, our uh, free areas uh, due to climate change? Um, uh, the severe uh, impact on the air quality is, is primarily affecting uh, marginalized communities. And here in the southern part of our state, uh, we're the most economically challenged part of the state of New Jersey uh, here in the southern and the, the southeastern and all the way to the Delaware Bay. Um, because of our economic challenges, we have educational challenges. We have health challenges. Uh, children uh, are, are at the lowest of the kids count in this state of New Jersey, as far as health goes. Maternal mortality is the highest in our area in the state of New Jersey. And all of these are factors that relate to our climate and the energy that we use that is, exacerbates uh, dirty air and what we have to breathe. Um, so, what we need to do is accept the fact that this is changing. This is a great alternative. We, we really have no choice. Everybody needs to embrace this because it is the answer to so many of our issues here, primarily in the, in the Southern part of the state. We have uh, the factory over in Salem County in, uh, in I think it's in Penns Grove where, where the um, turbines are going to be built. It is uniquely uh, suitable. There, there are no, uh, bridges, nothing in the way to float the that uh, float the turbine parts that are going to be needed out in the ocean from the bay out there. There's no impediments to getting them there. That's very unusual. Um, we have uh, our community college and one of our four-year universities, Atlantic Cape Community College and Rowan University, have specific programs to train uh, workers for this in industry. Like Dominic said. Um, this is going to bring high paying union jobs to our area, which we so desperately need. We cannot continue to be primarily a tourist destination. We love our tourism. That's what we've been doing for 200 years. We love it. Come to Atlantic City. It's a great place. But we need more. We need more to be able to support the families who live here. And, and this is the way to do it. So not only will we be helping uh, create uh, a change that will improve our air quality and and our environment, but we'll be improving the lives of our residents economically, educationally, and in their health, health uh, lives as well. So uh, this is why I am a huge proponent. Somebody emailed me, um, one of those folks who's against the, the wind farm said, you know, it's coming up on election time. We want to know how you feel. And I told her I've always been very clear. This is what we need to do. We cannot live in the past. We have to move to the future. The future will never look like the past. We can remember and, and have great memories, but what's coming up is only gonna be beneficial to all of our residents here in New Jersey and really worldwide. We need to embrace this as a small worldwide community. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate your comments and, and uh, it really hits close to home. Now we are transitioning from snow days to flood days. Uh, and, um, you know, sending thoughts to you as you're right on the coast there and dealing with a lot of these incoming storms, which, as you rightfully pointed out, will be mitigated and the effects of the storm surge and the buffering of the wind will actually be reduced because of um, because of the wind turbines and the, the wind farm. So thank you, Karen. We'll next turn to a council member, city council member in Schenectady, John Poleme. Uh, who is also an associate professor of economics. Uh, John, take it away. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, sustainability is key for our environment. Think about it in these terms. Everything we produce comes from the environment, and there are limited resources in this environment. At some point, we're going to run out of these resources without prudent action. 
When we talk about energy supply, even the biggest proponents of fossil fuels will acknowledge that supply will dwindle. In simple economic terms, the law of supply and demand tells us that as that happens, energy costs will increase substantially. Now consider sustainable energy. Sustainable energy is the form of energy that meets our demand for energy without the danger of getting expired or depleted and can be used repeatedly. Then when we take into consideration that with sustainable energy, we also do not need to worry about the environmental degradation that occurs from greenhouse gas emissions, sustainable energy becomes that much more attractive. As has been talked about already, one of the more important sources of sustainable energy is wind power. Although still at the beginning stages in the United States, offshore wind is now recognized globally as one of the principal energy sources to combat climate change. Furthermore, developing our offshore wind energy supply creates jobs and helps develop local economies. Major investments will be spent in materials and workmanships to build and maintain the facilities necessary to offshore wind energy. This means new jobs that will create higher incomes and more disposable income that will be spent in the local economy. For example, wind energy turbine technicians earn a median annual salary of $56,230. That's as of May 2020. Jobs like these will result in an increase in the local tax base as skilled labor moves into neighboring cities, towns, and villages. The effect is more revenue for those municipalities in the form of additional sales tax and property tax as property values increase from increased demand for both permanent and rental housing, as well as better environmental conditions. This in turn can be used for further economic development projects, such as roads and water infrastructure, which will also create additional tax revenue. As you can see, the direct and indirect economic benefits of offshore wind is enormous from the resulting massive multiplier effect. To provide a little information on the level of economic activity we're talking about, According to the American Wind Energy Association, by 2030, operating offshore wind capacity will be between 20 to 30 gigawatts, creating up to 83,000 jobs, representing between 28 to $57 billion of investment in the U.S. economy. Presently, offshore wind energy policies are being driven by the states. Current policies in just eight states call for nearly 40 megawatts of offshore wind capacity by 2040, providing a pathway to achieving the national offshore wind energy target of 30 gigawatts by 2030. As our country develops more offshore wind, the economies of scale will continue to improve and costs will decline. For example, the costs of energy for U.S. fixed bottom offshore wind energy projects in 2021 has declined to $84 per megawatt hour on average. This decrease in cost was 13%, a 13% reduction from 2020 and a total cost reduction of more than 50% since 2014. Costs for fixed bottom offshore wind energy are estimated to fall to $60 per megawatt hour on average by 2030. In comparison, the real-time load weighted average locational marginal price for natural gas reached $54.13 per megawatt hour this summer and wholesale power prices are now between $70 per megawatt hour and $110 per megawatt hour. In New York State, 12 port sites have been identified to achieve the energy output target by 2035. According to the New York State Energy Research and Development Agency, direct economic benefit, should this full build out alternative come to fruition, will include more than 3,000 job years, where one job year equals one job per year during construction, and more, more than 1,300 job years every year to operate and maintain the projects. An additional nearly 1,100 job years is expected in indirect economic benefit in the social and community investment expenditures. Other indirect benefits include savings of more than $4 billion in public health costs from reduced respiratory, cardiovascular, cancer, and neurological diseases. As you can see, offshore wind isn't just about the environment, it's also about securing our energy and economic futures. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, so much, John, for highlighting the economic benefits to communities and making the case that 
uh, of the benefits to communities across the country and, and on the eastern seaboard have never been greater from a jobs perspective, energy, security, health benefits. So thank you so much for raising up that economic analysis. We'll next turn to council member uh, in Franklin, Massachusetts, Kobe Frangiolo, who's also a policy expert on offshore wind. Council member Frangiolo. Yes, hello, thank you. Well, uh, here in, in Franklin, uh, we just experienced a, a summer of record droughts and record heat waves. Um, we, we just celebrated our uh, harvest festival and it was the first harvest festival where I've heard so many uh, local farmers and gardeners talking about uh, dying crops um, at a rate that they hadn't seen. Um, we're, we're also facing, it was just announced that our electricity prices are going to more than double compared to last year's uh, winter. Why? Because we're so reliant on natural gas, which is in turn uh, reliant on uh, foreign forces, including um, a dictator in, in Russia. Uh, so we recognize uh, urgently in Massachusetts uh, the benefits of switching to a more uh, local uh, energy source like offshore wind. Uh, the benefits of offshore winds are, are really uh, threefold. It's local power to help with energy security and to meet our uh, emissions reduction goals. It's local jobs, um, and especially jobs where we need it most. And, and it's local supply chain, money coming in, because we know that the whole world uh, is going to be moving in this direction uh, quickly over the next few decades. Um, on, on local power, it's already been said, we have a goal, uh, a national goal of reaching 30 gigawatts uh, by 2030. Uh, well, according to uh, DOE, DOE's uh, NREL, National Renewable Energy Lab, Massachusetts waters have the largest technical potential uh, of any state in the contiguous US with the technical potential to produce more than 1000 terawatt hours of electricity uh, from offshore wind. That is many fold the needs of Massachusetts. Uh, we've already um, set out to uh, uh, contracted out 5,600 5, megawatts of, of really cost effective uh, offshore wind by 2027. Um, we know that uh, meeting the emissions reductions and, and powering over uh, 1 million Massachusetts homes uh, are, are only part of the benefits of these first few projects. Um, the, uh, the first project, Vineyard Wind, uh, which is gonna be operational two years from now. And I was at the groundbreaking and, and where we, we dug um, into the ground for the, for the first time. Uh, those 62 turbines will generate uh, more than 800 megawatts of electricity. That's enough to power 400,000 homes in Massachusetts. That's the equivalent of taking 325,000 cars off the road uh, in one year. The project is also going to generate 3,600 full-time equivalent job years over the life of the project, including 500 uh, union jobs. Uh, this is all just the first project, just the first 800 megawatts toward uh, 30 gigawatts. Um, it, it's already uh, been said that uh, to, to meet our 2030 uh, goals, uh, we're gonna need more than 44,000 good paying union jobs uh, by 2030 and another 33,000 uh, additional jobs created in the communities that then support uh, offshore wind activity, which is, which is what we're really um, excited about here. Um, it, it is both, uh, the industry is, is both large and uh, continuing to grow. We already have more than 120,000 uh, workers at over 500 companies uh, by one estimate involved in the offshore uh, wind industry in some way. Um, and we expect that by 2050, employment will, will reach uh, 600,000 job, jobs. Uh, I, I talked about how you know, part of the benefit is that the, the nation and, and, and really the world is gonna be growing offshore wind. And if we can act first as a country, as a nation, um, and really be the hub of producing offshore wind, uh, we can capture that. The, the, the Global Wind Energy Council estimates that offshore wind today is only 2% of what the world needs by 2050. 
So it's about to explode and we want to be able to capture that here. As it's already been pointed out, um, just by 2030, we expect that uh, 28 to $57 billion in total uh, investment will come to the US economy um, from our build out of, of offshore wind. Now, Massachusetts recognizes the benefits. Uh, in 2021, we passed a, a roadmap bill which set us on the goal of reaching net zero by 2050, 50% uh, emissions reductions by 2030, 40% renewable energy by 2030. And then just this summer, um, I had the, the opportunity to, uh, through my work uh, at the State House and, and our uh, Massachusetts uh, Committee on Telecommunications, Utilities and Energy to uh, sign into law an act driving clean energy and offshore wind where we specifically highlighted offshore wind as key to meeting our energy needs and capturing uh, the economic benefits um, of the, the burgeoning industry. Um, we're doing our part here locally and, and we're here really to call uh, on the federal government to, to, to join us, recognize uh, the benefits, help us uh, bring down our local emissions, bring down job or uh, bring us jobs where we need it most, capture uh, the economic benefits by both opening up more federal lease areas and uh, using federal funds to really support um, some quick uh, infrastructure build out in our ports and our supply chain. So thank you very much for your time and I'm uh, looking forward to answering some questions. Thank you so much, uh, Council Member, for highlighting both Massachusetts' role, and it's exciting to see the progress uh, that, that is taking place in Massachusetts, and you, and you pointed out, is just the beginning. And you, you also pointed out how the U.S. has a chance to lead the world in, in offshore wind deployment. And that's part of the reason that we're here today asking the federal government to increase its offshore wind goals and accelerating permitting. So, so the U.S. really can take the lead uh, position in that globally and take advantage of the job benefits, as, as you pointed out. This is a growth industry, and we want to be in front of this for to benefit our climate and our communities. So moving on now to... Uh, former council member in Rye, New York, uh, Sarah Goddard. Uh, Sarah. Hi, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's so great to be here and see some familiar faces. Uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to join you all today. And uh, I think the operative word of today is local. And I think uh, council member Frangillo has summed it up, local power, um, that is, that is where we're going. And, and those are the opportunities that we can have to help nudge um, uh, our, our colleagues at the federal level along. Um, I am from the city of Rye. It's a beautiful coastal community on Long Island Sound in Westchester County. Uh, but we are a community uh, like so many others that has experienced firsthand the de devastating effects of our climate crisis. Uh, most recently, uh, last year with uh, severe flooding from uh, Hurricane Ida that destroyed homes and people's properties. But uh, Ida is just one of several climate related hundred year catastrophes as they've been called, but no more um, that I've experienced as a resident and elected official. Uh, as Commissioner Fitzpatrick uh, said earlier, we are in a new world now and we need to respond to our new world. Uh, Rye is rebuilding, uh, it can do so, but there is no greater urgency uh, today than for swift and decisive climate action, particularly when it comes to assisting our most vulnerable and hard hit communities in Westchester and throughout the state of New York and beyond. Fortunately, there is a solution to mitigating the disastrous impacts of climate change. By transitioning our power sector to clean renewable energy, we'll make significant headway in reducing greenhouse gas emissions that have resulted from burning coal, oil, and fracked gas for our power needs. Over the last 10 years, we've witnessed solar energy ramp up while uh, our costs have plummeted for solar energy. And we now have that opportunity uh, to make significant process, uh, progress in expanding the nation's clean energy portfolio with the addition of offshore wind power. 
Council member Palamani has highlighted the economic benefits of clean wind power, but there are real and tangible rewards for our citizens as council member Frangillo attested. It's in the form of well-paying jobs, clean air, energy security, and potential cost savings. Wind power will increase jobs for our citizens, spurring the development of new manufacturing hubs and residential areas. In New York, the most notable example is South Brooklyn's new offshore wind manufacturing hub, which will be one of the largest offshore wind facilities in the nation and will comprise a maritime shipping hub, training facilities, and the development of an entirely new residential area uh, named Industry City. <sighs> Clean wind power also improves and protects public health. Replacing dirty aging fossil fuel plants with clean wind power improves overall air quality, reducing smog, acid rain, and other atmospheric emissions that can cause a whole host of health problems. Clean wind power's health benefits are even greater, however, for fence line communities whose residents have suffered for years from the negative health effects of living near dangerously dirty industrial sites. Our citizens can also enjoy greater energy independence and national security from increased wind development. As demonstrated by the fossil fueled global energy crisis originating from a war across the Atlantic, energy independence is critical. Developing this nation's offshore wind power will provide us with greater protection from the unpredictable and uncontrollable fluctuations in traditional energy markets. And indeed, wind power focuses on local benefits, as Kobe has, has so rightly pointed out. Cost savings from offshore wind lease sales help fund public programs to reduce local tax burdens and energy costs. When compared to similar benefits from oil and gas lease sales, offshore wind lease sales prevail overwhelmingly by a factor of 125 times, according to a recent report. Like solar, the appeal of wind power crosses party lines as both voters and elected officials recognize renewable energy's many social and financial benefits. The top states for wind generation include Texas and Oklahoma, while Wyoming's wind power generation has doubled in two years with more projects in the pipeline. According to a recent poll, both red and blue voters support green energy in the form of solar and wind power. Now we have offshore wind literally on the horizon for coastal states. Its wind potential could provide thousands of gigawatts of new clean power for our nation. As we transition more to driving EVs and heating with electricity, we'll need more electric energy. Offshore wind could be how we'll get it as long as the federal offshore wind goal is increased. As a New Yorker, I am proud that my state has an exciting opportunity to continue its role as a climate leader with its significant investment plans for offshore wind development. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, former council member um, Goddard. Really appreciate your comments and highlighting both the, the benefits in, in jobs, but also echoing council member Frangillo's comments on the energy security and the need to transition away from fossil fuel dictatorships as well. So thank you for lifting up all of those benefits. Uh, and I see that uh, council member uh, Mary Lupian has joined us. Um, Mary. Uh, we would love to go to you. Uh, council Member Lupian is, is a Rochester City Council member uh, and a member of our EOPA New York Leadership Council. Uh, council Member Lupian, floor is yours. Hi, I am so glad to be here. Thank you. And I'm excited that there's so much momentum and investment in wind projects in New York State and across the country. With five offshore wind projects currently in active development in New York, which is the largest offshore wind pipeline in the nation. These projects will account for 50% of the mandate set by the New York Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, or CLCPA, to have 900 megawatts of offshore wind by 2035. And this goal will contribute to achieving a carbon-free power grid by 2040, as well as diversifying the nation's energy supply, which will increase our natural, national security by accelerating our in energy independence 
and reducing air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. However, all of these great projects are in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of New York City. Being so far from the coastline, Western New York hasn't really been on the radar when it comes to offshore wind. But there's amazing potential and an opportunity to develop, the, to develop offshore wind off of Great Lakes, Ontario and Erie, which are both very near Rochester. And in fact, New York's combined Atlantic Coast and Great Lakes offshore wind capacity is 147 gigawatts. Future Western New York wind projects have the potential to not just account for the remaining 50%, but to surpass New York's goal of 9,000 megawatts by 16 times over. Coastal and Great Lakes states account for 80% of the electricity demand in the whole country, which means that this clean never ending energy can create electricity for the majority of Americans by powering our major population centers. And in New York, further aided by our governor Hochul's commitment this year to 500 million investments in offshore wind projects, including manufacturing and supply chain infrastructure, the potential in New York is incredible for transforming our energy grid to clean renewable energy. But I must say, it is our duty to use this huge opportunity to create prosperity for our people in the way of creating well-paying green jobs and to make good on the CLCPA's mandate of requiring underserved communities to receive at least 30% of the benefits of renewable energy generation. There are these are the communities that have suffered the most from the negative impacts of our current energy infrastructure and the economic disparities that have persisted due to racism. And Rochester is one of those underserved communities. Our city ranks number one in the country for extreme poverty. And compared with cities our size, we rank the number one worst city in the United States for childhood poverty, with 48% of our children living under the poverty line. Deployment of offshore wind in Rochester would create thousands of good green union jobs with workers trained in installation, maintenance and manufacturing and can deliver billions in economic impact to the area. And Rochester, like many cities, is experiencing a housing crisis. A recent market study shows that depressed wages were at the heart of this affordability crisis. And these jobs that would be created by offshore wind would immediately benefit our people, giving them the resources that they need to increase their quality of life for their families and the entire community. Offshore wind represents an incredible opportunity for Rochester to also become a manufacturing hub shipping turbine blades, towers, and engines all across the Great Lakes. Historically, the cost associated with offshore has been a huge barrier, but the cost of not investing in offshore winds in the Great Lakes is very high. New Yorkers have already been paying the price in the tunes of hundreds of billions of dollars because of the extreme weather events due to climate change. And we have paid the cost not in just in dollars, but in lives. Investing all that we can in renewable energy and its infrastructure protects you New York from the worst effects of climate change. It's our moral responsibility. We have to say yes to climate action. And that means saying yes to offshore wind projects, both on our coastline and in Western New York. And uh, I'll end with this phrase, an inch on the horizon is better than six inches in your basement. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Lupian for those comments. and. Um, also lifting up that New York is uniquely situated. It is, is one of the few states in the country that can have wind, offshore wind development from coast to coast. And uh, thank you also for raising up the, the racial justice aspects of offshore wind development with the, the restorative justice by creating jobs in, in historically marginalized communities, including central Rochester as well. And, and you pointed out how uh, Governor, Governor Hochul and her leadership on investments in supply and manufacturing um, is, is an excellent start and the states can't do it alone. And that's why, again, we're here as elected officials across the country asking the federal government to increase its offshore wind goals and accelerate permitting. So with that, we will transition to questions. We have a number of questions coming in from our audience. The first goes to Commissioner Fitzpatrick in Atlantic City. The question being, Atlantic City has big business interests in tourism. Are those interests backing offshore wind development or, or are they planning on moving? Um, Commissioner Fitzpatrick. Thanks, Dominic. That's, that's a great question. 
Our uh, business industries in Atlantic City and the surrounding area have invested a lot of time and money in growing the industry. I, I think you're talking about, you know, the tourism and the, the hotels and casinos that are here. They're not leaving. They're not going anywhere. They're actually making improvements and making changes and trying to figure out how to uh, uh, coordinate their investments with the changes that are going on in the environment. And, uh, you know, we have, as I said, invested in uh, education and training to support the wind industry. Um, our state government, our Governor Murphy has created some lofty goals for us and we are on target to meet those goals to be, have clean energy in the state of New Jersey by 2050. That's only 25 years from now. Um, by the way, that's not a very long time. Um, but yeah, we have a lot of investment coming into Atlantic City. A lot of small investors are bringing their dollars and their ideas to the city um, to help diversify the tourism industry. In addition to uh, gaming and food, we're uh, having a lot of uh, music venues being opened and built and um, uh, entertainment that is, that's away from the big hotels. So yeah, people are bringing their money. They're not going anywhere. They're continuing to come to Atlantic City to invest. Those comments. Next question, uh, generally for the for the crew is: as elected leaders, what policies or actions do you think is important to ensure historically marginalized and disadvantaged communities re, uh, benefit from the infrastructure investments needed? And I think that could go to you, um, Council Member uh, Vice President Wukin. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think you know between the mandate and the CLCPA, and um, also we're we're trying to understand the benefits that would be coming to us from the Justice 40 initiative. Um, because in New York, um, the definition for this initiative, the definition of disadvantaged community um, differs from what a lot of people might think. And there are very few communities in New York that are designated with um, as disadvantaged according to Justice 40 in Rochester, all of our um, city is in that designation. And we're joined, I think by a, a census, uh, tracked in Schenectady, in um, Niagara Falls, and some downstate. But looking at those opportunities to see how much investment we can use to ensure that we're bringing, um, first of all, we're building offshore in our Great Lake of Ontario, but also that we're focusing on um, bringing jobs here. And I think reserving and marketing those jobs, making sure that we've got training opportunities to get our folks into these jobs is going to make a huge impact on our um, disadvantaged community. Wonderful. And a follow-up question on, in terms of those jobs, what support do, uh, do local communities need to make sure those jobs are provided um, in terms of support from the state and local government? We can open that up to uh, all, the, all of our panelists. One of the things that we're doing here in Massachusetts, um, so we, we designated Massachusetts environmental justice communities, um, which are communities that have been uh, historically um, harmed and are most vulnerable to future um, environmental impacts, um, as well as uh, having um, uh, being low income places and, and mostly um, minority populations. Uh, we highlight in every piece of legislation um, around offshore wind, both workforce development and in selecting jobs, um, we, we highlight benefits to environmental justice communities as uh, one of the um, things that's gonna help you win a project with us is how much are you gonna be supporting our environmental justice uh, communities? Um, what does that usually come in the, in the form of? Well, these communities have uh, institutions in place. They have community colleges. Uh, they have um, area groups and, and nonprofits. And so most of it is about uh, helping the local institutions that already exist, um, helping them rise up because they already have the connections uh, in those communities. So we've, we've made Bristol Community College, which is around a whole bunch of um, currently disadvantaged uh, coastal communities in Massachusetts. Um, we've made them a National Offshore Wind Institute and are putting millions and millions of dollars into helping them uh, both uh, build up their technical uh, 
training potential, as well as resources to help uh, connect them uh, with students. We're also working closely with the unions um, who have a lot of ties, um, but helping them uh, be connected with, with people in the community. Uh, if I could just say in, in Massachusetts, it's particularly unique. And, and I would imagine that this must be true in other uh, communities, but our, our coastal communities um, have historically uh, been the uh, communities that have seen industry leave um, and, and go uh, overseas. And so um, the, the three communities that are really, uh, that really stand to benefit the most in Massachusetts are uh, New Bedford, which uh, for years was the city that lit the world um, because it, it produced so much whale oil, uh, which is how everyone um, lit all their uh, candles and, and, and street lights. Um, that has been a, a now down uh, trodden community, um, but stands to light the world uh, again. Uh, the other two, Somerset and um, Salem, have coal-fired power plants that were the major uh, industries and employers in town that have since shut down. Those coal-fired power plants are exactly where um, new companies and uh, staging facilities and where the uh, power is gonna come in is right on those coal-fired power plants. So it's a really great story of uh, some old power communities um, that once uh, powered the world uh, are now, um, uh, economically disadvantaged who really stand to benefit the most just by the nature of, of where they are. Wonderful. Thank you, council member. Uh, we have a another question that's come in for all, all, all of our panelists, which is what are some of the biggest challenges in getting offshore wind energy up and running in your different jurisdictions? I can I can speak to that. I know um, like I mentioned, that cost has been a burden and a lot of this funding can help alleviate that. But in the past, it's been a challenge um, that our leaders in the past had just thought it was out of reach, that we'd never be able to do it. Our current mayor, uh, Malik Evans, is actually really supportive of this idea. But I think uh, a barrier is around the technical nature, making sure that we know what we need um, to, uh, to implement it, but also you know, the coastal communities along the, um, the Great Lakes tend to be our more wealthy residents. And sometimes that can be a barrier in terms of aesthetics where we've gotten pushback um, and a certain number of those residents need to be on board uh, for implementing a project. And actually not in Rochester, but nearby, we uh, came into uh, um, climate activists we're kind of split over this idea about wind because of the birds. And so our local Sierra Club was against wind energy, which you wouldn't necessarily think about, but I think that's a, a, a conflict that really needs to be resolved. And I see um, you know, a, a question about you know, fishing lanes and shipping lanes. And, and I, I see those as all related. It's really about you know, patterns of, uh, whether it's birds or ships or, or fishing um, that need to be resolved uh, if we're gonna put big uh, turbines potentially in their way. But all those problems I think have an answer. We just have to work with the people to get it done. If, if I could uh, touch or follow on uh, what council member Lukian says, cause I think it's a really good point about public perception and how um, just, pure misunderstanding, but also coupled with active uh, disinformation campaigns can uh, obscure and color public uh, perception of wind turbine projects and what that will entail either for, um, you know, for birds or the aesthetics. Uh, and when when we sit down and talk about the personal benefits over uh, some of the potential and, and probably inflated uh, uh, costs of aesthetics or, or you know, wildlife, which is really quite minimal. When we highlight those benefits for our citizens and for our people who live in these areas, it really is a no-brainer 
Um, but I think the message uh, that, that legislators, policymakers, supporters have, uh, have to get across is that local uh, benefit um, more, even more so than the macroeconomic benefits that I think we all agree on. So, you know, the fact that you, that you see legislators and policy, policymakers across the country, whether it's red state or blue state, embracing this type of power is testament to the fact that it is the right way to go. Um, but we just have to get that message across at, um, at a more uh, public level. Wonderful. Thank you, former council member Goddard. And um, a related question, what are some of the legislative changes that we need building on those challenges that we're facing in, in communities in our, in our different states? What are some of the legislative changes that we need to accelerate permitting on offshore wind? And a related question would be, what, uh, why is it important for the federal government to step in here, given that's uh, what we're calling on the federal government to do to help accelerate this industry? Yeah, so because of uh, the, the first offshore wind projects were actually um, in state waters and they were closer to shore and, and um, they didn't find much success for a lot of the uh, reasons that were just uh, enumerated. Uh, but luckily, our uh, science has, has um, progressed so quickly, um, we can really go uh, very uh, far uh, into um, our offshore areas, um, which both decreases the, uh, the site impacts, uh, as well as allows us to be much more flexible with, with shipping lanes and, and fishing lanes. Um, but those are all federally uh, owned lease areas. And so um, we can't do anything locally as much as we would like to, unless they're opened up at a federal level. Um, and that that's simply, uh, it's executive uh, decisions. It's the Department of Interior uh, that makes the, the decision around um, what lease areas are open. Um, but as anything else in the, um, th that our government does, um, executive action uh, comes from uh, legislative direction and um, legislative direction to open up a certain amount of, of uh, offshore wind lease areas. Um, we'll push the, the uh, agencies to do so, and then we'll allow us states to, to start acting and ramp up our operations. Okay, thank you, council member. Other comments on why we're asking for the federal government to get involved, why that's important from your perspective. I'll jump in with one, which is one reason that we're asking for the federal government to increase its offshore wind goals and streamline and accelerate permitting is to give more stability for the business, uh, for industry that's coming in and to stabilize energy prices, which is, Council Member, you pointed out are doubling uh, this year. So this is about energy security. This is about uh, energy, local energy freedom, clean energy freedom here at home, as well as uh, stabilizing prices for consumers in order to get these. Uh, and we can do that by getting these projects off the ground as soon as possible, uh, responsibly. Great. Um, related, we touched on it earlier. We have a time for um, maybe a few more questions. Uh, how will we address fishing industry concerns um, in other industries that may be impacted? So whether it's in industrial fishing, fish habitat, and uh, shipping lane access. How do we balance those, those different issues? I can answer that to a certain extent. I, I, my understanding from my, uh, and I, I think probably the experts should weigh in this, but that there, that there really should not be concerns related to fishing uh, with the presence of offshore wind turbine projects. Um, but again, this comes down to uh, reassuring uh, the fishing industry, the public uh, of, of those facts. And I think sometimes uh, there's just a, a lack of, of understanding um, and a fear of the unknown. And, uh, and to the extent that uh, 
policymakers and lawmakers can get in front of those concerns and address those concerns before they become, uh, uh, you know, uh, mis misinformation. Um, that's probably the best thing that we can do uh, because I'm sure that this is is a, a major worry of of uh, you know of, of areas around that. Uh, you know, around where uh, projects are being planned. So it's a matter of getting in front of the message now and, and answering it proactively rather than waiting for the storm, no pun intended, to, 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 to come. Yeah, pro proactive is the key word. Um, I've mentioned New Bedford as, as one of the communities. Well, New Bedford is, for the past two decades has been the number one uh, commercial fishing port in the country uh, by value. Um, so they are highly sensitive to uh, the commercial fishing industry. And it's really just taken years of relationship building, uh, of working with them, not just to sell them on the benefits uh, of offshore end, but really, really here, um, what do you need um, from the industry that's going to help you? Um, what are the seasons of, of building that are going to impact you the least? Uh, how much, how large do we, do our fishing lanes need to be? And that's been a huge piece is, is really having large fishing lanes. Where are your biggest um, fishing areas? And, and uh, can we avoid uh, those uh, as much as possible? Um, th those are really, really critical conversations. And the earlier you have them, the better. I, I'm proud to say that all our um, our ports, uh, including the New Bedford Port Authority, are huge allies in the uh, offshore wind industry here in Massachusetts. They recognize the job benefits. They recognize uh, the benefits of, of having um, more ships, more federal money come in, more state money come in uh, to improve uh, the port. And, and they've really just been working with us uh, from day one to make sure that we're minimizing impacts. One, one strange benefit of, of offshore wind is that it becomes um, a, a sort of coral. And uh, we, we've seen lots of studies say that um, small fish start popping up around uh, the offshore wind, which then bring uh, larger fishing. And so it's had this um, strange effect of actually increasing um, more uh, recreational fishing uh, around the offshore uh, wind turbines, which has been a, a small side uh, benefit uh, from the early industry. Uh, thank you, Council Member. And this is a question for um, uh, Vice President Lupian as well as, uh, as, as Council Member Poemi. What would be the benefits for, uh, or sorry, the, the question is, given industry has left areas like Western New York, uh, how could Western New York become a hub for uh, wind turbine manufacturing and what will it take for that to occur? I think it would greatly benefit our communities. and. Rochester is really well situated. We, um, even though we're um, maybe 10 miles in from Lake Ontario, our, our uh, city's founders made a little strip that has uh, a little part of Rochester that's on Lake Ontario. And it would be very um, easy to ship the turbines through the Great Lakes, um, but also you know, being connected to many other states through the interstate I think it makes sense for, uh, you know, geographically for Rochester and Western New York to be a hub for manufacturing. Um, and, and as you mentioned, um, industry has, has left. We, we used to be a huge manufacturing city and we still have many of the bones of factories and industrial areas that could be built back up to support this industry. And I think we still have a lot of uh, work to do in terms of uh, doing the studies to understand um, exactly what it what it takes, um, but it would be a huge benefit to our people just in terms of jobs. And again, those are really good jobs um, and being able to make these um, the parts to build the turbines much more accessible. For uh, Schenectady in the Capital District in New York State, um, we have a very unique geographic uh, I think advantage. Uh, if you just go out for a five hour radius, 
uh, within that radius, you would have Buffalo, you would have Rochester, you would have Philadelphia, New York City, Boston, Montreal, Toronto, uh, some very major areas. Uh, and that includes the transportation routes, uh, whether they be water, rail, or um, road. So to have the manufacturing of the parts uh, in, in our communities uh, would be very beneficial for people for jobs, but also uh, it has that advantage, that geographic advantage of being able to transport those parts relatively easily to uh, large communities uh, and coastal communities. Um, so in order to facilitate that, uh, some of the things that have been talked about already include uh, using our community colleges and our state university system uh, to develop the um, training programs and the uh, those type of things in order to uh, get our, our population trained and up and ready for uh, building out these, these uh, necessary components. Uh, in order to have these good paying jobs in the communities. As you were speaking, I was feeling a little bit competitive, but it's a good thing that there is so much demand. There's enough for all of us. Yes, and that's a wonderful uh, place to leave it as well. Um, so just to close out, uh, you know, I'd like to thank our panelists and, and ask you to stay on um, just a little bit after we close out. But thank you so much to all of our, the elected officials uh, who are speaking today, to members of the press and our audience for coming. And uh, again, the, all the points that you've all raised is, is exactly why over 340 elected officials are calling on the federal government to increase its offshore wind permitting and accelerate, uh, increase the wind goals and accelerate the permitting for our energy security, creating jobs, um, health, resilience, and protecting our communities and our climate. So thank you so much. And with that, uh, we'll close the press conference and ask our panelists to stay on for a few minutes afterwards. Thank you so much.